This month, we meet a former FIFA World Cup winner. We take to the skies to view Doha from above. And we find out which teams booked the last three spots for Qatar 2022. Twenty-four years ago, on the 11th of July 1998, France went into a state of huge celebration as the country witnessed its national football team brush Brazil aside to claim their first FIFA World Cup title. A key figure in that team was Marcel Desailly. The World Cup in France was really fantastic. First of all, because the infrastructure was great, the organization was wonderful, and the final was an ideal final between Brazil, the holders, and France, the host country. There was a real energy, I think, through the composition of the French team with different backgrounds. There was a real energy around that. There was a global togetherness around that World Cup, that final. It was unique. It was a really unique, strong World Cup with the fantastic Stade de France. I think that everyone who's old enough can remember the images and the energy of that World Cup. That's what convinces us that football is magic when we think about the 1998 World Cup. reference de la Coupe du Monde 98. Four years later, Marcel Desai captained his country in Japan and South Korea. But after failing to win a game or score a single goal, the experience was very different from 1998. But now he believes the current France team can build on their momentum as world champions. It's true that in 2002, we, France, during that World Cup, we had several players injured at the end of the season. It's always tiring for the players. We had the same thing in 1998 and 2002. In 2002, I think our stress management wasn't great and we didn't manage to enhance our level of playing. On the other hand, the new generation, they have a type of insouciance and that insouciance will allow them to manage their stress. Once you've controlled your stress, they've got talent, maybe even more than we did in our time. They'll get their great performance and they'll reproduce what's not been done since 1958. Brazil and 1962. Brazil as well, twice consecutively. So yes, I think it'd be good if this team reproduces that performance. Desai finished his professional football career in Qatar, where he played for Al Garafa, winning the league in the 2004-05 season. And finally, with Qatar Sports Club, leading them to second place in the league. He noticed immediately that Qatar has a definite vision for footballing success. In 2004 5, they created Aspire Academy. They had a clear idea of progress. They brought over players, old players, who were like me at the end of their career, to share that experience we'd had in the European leagues. They did that progressively, and they've succeeded. They won the Asian Cup, they have energy. They have the World Cup. The notion of sport for Qatar has always been to integrate education and sport. There's a whole lot of sporting activity and it's great for Qatar to have this World Cup and to allow the Middle East to have access to this competition to bring a boost in interest. 
Having experienced Qatar's appetite for football, the World Cup winner feels that bringing the biggest show on earth together is a good decision. Dans cette notion de partage, and so, given this notion of sharing, this World Cup had to come to the Middle East. It had already been to Asia in the World Cup of 2002 in South Korea and Japan. And so it's important that the Middle East gets to experience the World Cup, the fervour, the importance of football around the world. In terms of the development of infrastructure, yes, I think it's logical in the context of the development of football worldwide. The skies above Qatar are often filled with falcons, the national bird of this Arabian peninsula, or aircraft, as Hamad International Airport is a busy hub handling over 30 million passengers a year. However, during the winter months, hot air balloons can also be seen floating over the desert dunes and the Doha skyline. The event is relatively new in Qatar, and the organizers are delighted about its popularity. طبعاً اللي يميز مهرجان قطر للمناطيد في قطر هو طبعاً الحضور. What makes the hot air balloon festival in Qatar so special is the large number of attendants by people that admire this sport activity and also the amount of children that are interested in ballooning. Furthermore, we have a lot of touristic areas in Doha to show people from the balloon, like Aspire Zone, the sand dunes at Sea Line and other places like the skyline. So we have a lot of nice places to see from the skies of Doha. Ballooning offers a very smooth flight in total serenity and a bird's eye view of the world that excites even the most experienced airmen. I've been in aviation and in flying for the past uh, more than 30 years. But my first experience in a balloon ride was about five or six years ago. And uh, I must say it's a totally different experience. And uh, what I uh, felt and I experienced uh, was so enjoyable uh, uh, that I wanted uh, everybody else also to uh, experience the same. Ballooning over Qatar offers a unique view of the spectacular Doha skyline and the wind-swept dunes. It's uh, totally uh, different. I mean, uh, you must experience it to, uh, to appreciate it. Almost everyone, without exception, that has uh, flown in a balloon over the city of Doha comes back and says, wow, this was not something that I was expecting. It's a totally different view, and uh, it's, it's breathtaking uh, you know, uh, scenery that you see. Especially if you are flying over uh, Doha and you can see the Corniche or you can see the, the stadiums, uh, the, the built-up areas. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a very nice uh, experience to have. If the balloons make it back for Qatar National Day on December the 18th, 2022, the same day that the FIFA World Cup champions are crowned in Lucille Stadium, then there's no question where the best seat in the house will be. Next ballooning season will start in October. We will fly hot air balloons during that period until March 2023. With the ballooning especially, we, we fly uh, at sunrise. So uh, we will see how uh, best we can make uh, use of, of the event and the timing uh, during the FIFA World Cup. We look forward to it. World Environment Day, celebrated annually on the 5th of June, is the United Nations principal vehicle for encouraging awareness and action for the protection of the environment. FIFA President Gianni Infantino delivered a message raising a green card for the planet to support the initiative. Hello, I'm Gianni Infantino, FIFA President, and today on World Environment Day, it is not about uh, yellow cards or uh, red cards. Today I'm asking everyone who loves football and who cares about the environment to raise uh, FIFA's green card 
for the planet. FIFA is uh, playing its part with our aim to make the FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022 carbon neutral. As we continue to face growing environmental challenges, FIFA, Q22 and the host country are working towards delivering a carbon neutral FIFA World Cup. So a carbon neutral World Cup really means three things. First of all, you have understood what your carbon emissions are. Secondly, you have put as much effort as possible to ensure that you reduce as much carbon emissions as you can in areas that you control. And thirdly, for those emissions that you have not been able to reduce, then you follow a program to offset those emissions. As a result of careful planning and responsible delivery, the organisers have been certified to ISO 2012-1, the international standard that sets requirements for developing and implementing an effective management system to deliver a sustainable event. In simple terms, what it means is that a third-party certifier has actually confirmed that we're implementing a set of robust systems in order to ensure that the World Cup is as sustainable as possible. There is an inclusive World Cup, there is a green World Cup, there is a World Cup that generates economic value for the host country and that will have a positive long-term legacy. It is working with you know, transportation, with logistics, with marketing, with catering, with clean and waste management. Everybody is actually aiming to do their operations in a sustainable way. One of the things that I'm also very proud about that we have done for the first time is the way that we have managed our risks in the supply chain. Education City Stadium, which stands in the home of Qatar Foundation for Education, Science and Community Development, is a prime example of a structure that fulfills sustainability values as over 55% of its construction materials were procured locally. I think fans will react to Education City Stadium in a, in, a, in a great way. I mean, first of all, they will realize it looks like a real diamond in the middle of the desert. Secondly, it is so close to transport. I mean, there are various metro stations close by. There is a tram running in Education City itself. So very easy to get around, very easy to get to the stadium. Thirdly, there are going to be so many nice things to do around the stadium. By the way, 55% of the materials used to construct Education City came locally. So that is something to actually highlight about this amazing stadium. The stadium was officially inaugurated with a virtual ceremony in the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's already been put to the test during the FIFA Club World Cup and the FIFA Arab Cup. It was clear that the stadium was designed to make everyone feel welcome, safe and entertained. This included the operation of a sensory room for people with sensory needs, which will be available for all matches in Education City Stadium and two other stadiums during the FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022. Families and parents that have special need children that are not as visible, such as those that have autism or Down syndrome, still put in incredible efforts to be able to help and support their children. And the opportunity to have a sensory room makes it so much more enjoyable and so much easier to enjoy going and participating in a football match. Education City Stadium is now set to host eight matches, starting with Denmark taking on Tunisia in Group D. The stadium will finish with a quarter-final on the 9th of December. After the event, it will activate its post-tournament plan. Education City Stadium is going to be used by university students um, from different universities, by staff. It's going to be the home of the Qatar women's national football team. After the World Cup, the upper tiers of Education City are going to be removed. Then going to be uh, donated to other parts of the world, to other countries that will be keen recipients of those. So for example, they can be used to generate new stadiums, to generate new sporting facilities, or non-sporting facilities as well. Uh, one of the most important aspects of being a blueprint is how we deal with legacy. And legacy has been at the core of the tournament from the very beginning. That learning, those systems, those tools, uh, skills that were developed will continue to be used not only in Qatar but internationally for the benefit and the sustainability of future megasport events.
The vision for the FIFA World Cup 2022 has been clear from the beginning – to use the power of football to open the door to a world of amazing experiences. And the adventure is now just around the corner. Since the first World Cup back in 1930, each tournament has been represented by an official poster, showcasing both the passion for football in the host country and also the global scale of the event. The official poster for the FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022 was unveiled during a special ceremony at Hamad International Airport. For the first time, a series of posters has been developed for the tournament, all designed by female Qatari artist Bethaina Al Mufta. Known for her monochromatic aesthetic, Bethaina's style is heavily reflected in her FIFA World Cup images. This collaboration is certainly a great honor to be representing my country to the rest of the world through my creative expression especially as my inspirations are based on my country's past, present, and future. The collaboration in its nature is an extension of that very same inspiration, documenting my country's growth from the lens of its roots and foundations. The work aims to bring to the forefront a marriage between the old and the new with the birth of a prosperous and ever-growing future. Former FIFA World Cup winner Lothar Matthäus was also present at the launch and understands its significance. This will be the symbol for the World Cup uh, 2022 in uh, Qatar. This is traditional because I was followed uh, in the last 50 years a lot of World Cups and we have always something in our brain like a memory. This latest poster joins a line of famous designs from over the years and it was the iconic image of Italian 90 that brought the memories back for the former German captain. This is a poster from uh, 1990, from Italy, when I won the World Cup. It's a great memory. And uh, this memory I have still, after 32 years, in my brain. Yeah? It's shiny for me. And I hope this will shine forever for the Football World Cup 2022 in Qatar. Bothaina Al Mufta will be hoping her posters can inspire her country to go all the way in Qatar 2022. I think the World Cup is going to be a powerful reminder of teamwork and unity. Everyone can come together under one umbrella, sharing one purpose. Qatar hosted FIFA's intercontinental playoff matches as four teams battled it out for the remaining two places at the FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022. 10,000 Peru fans flooded Ahmed bin Ali Stadium in anticipation of qualifying for their second successive FIFA World Cup. Australia had the best of the 90 minutes of normal time. In extra time, neither side looked like breaking the deadlock. And as penalty kicks loomed, Australian head coach Graham Arnold played his final card by substituting Socceroos captain Matt Ryan with Andrew Redmayne for only his third Australian cap. Fans were set for a dramatic climax that would bring joy for one nation and heartbreak for the other. Australia started the penalty shootout nervously when Martin Boyle's penalty kick was saved, giving Peru the early advantage. That advantage was cut when Luis Advincula struck the post with his spot kick. It went to sudden death, with Mabil calmly making it 5-4, which set the stage for super sub Redmayne to dance across the goal line before saving Alex Valera's spot kick, handing Australia their ticket to Qatar. There were contrasting emotions for the two sets of travelling fans. Come guys, come, make the effort. It's a, it's a long trek, it's a good 14 hour flight, but absolutely worth make it. the effort and worth it. Come People down. are so friendly, the hospitality is amazing, yeah. the weather's great. Public transport's really, really good, really good. It's, a, it's a small country, so getting around would be yeah. really well, really good as well. 
espero donde esté Perú, yo voy a estar con... Wherever the national team of Peru will go, I will go. I cry because our national team play with heart. This jersey represents our soul, and it will be our soul. I will follow Peru wherever they are. Australia will now join Group D alongside France, Denmark and Tunisia. The following evening, the drama continued. Costa Rica supporters were hoping to see their country qualify for their third straight FIFA World Cup. New Zealand also had a faithful following as their trusted Flying Kiwis group had travelled to Qatar hoping to see their country qualify for their first FIFA World Cup since 2010. Los Ticos took an early lead when Joel Campbell scored in the third minute. New Zealand fought back and striker Chris Wood had the ball in the net in the 39th minute only for VAR to overrule the strike after a foul in the build-up. The Czech found that Matthew Garbett had fouled Oscar Duarte. Man of the match, Keylor Navas, held the All Whites at bay with a string of saves. On the final whistle, there were jubilant scenes as the Costa Rican players celebrated with their families, but disappointment for the Flying Kiwis. Uh, so the Flying Kiwis is, I guess, a concept or a, or a dream. We flew from 17 different cities around the world to be here, so a lot of organising and coordinating at late nights and different time zones to make it here. So we came here with a lot of hope in our hearts and it's quite uh, bittersweet, I guess, because uh, I think we had chances to, to make an impact on the game. Being from Costa Rica, I'm really proud. Since 2014, we haven't qualified. Being such a small country and qualifying, it really means a lot to us. And it was a good game. It was a very good game. And we're all really proud. Like, it's a bit emotional for me, but yeah, I'm really proud of my country. Viva Costa Rica! Costa Rica's victory means they will take their place in Group E in Qatar, along with Spain, Germany, and Japan. After 864 matches, 2,426 goals, 209 teams have now become 32, the flags of which are now flying proudly in Doha, awaiting the fans in November. Next month, we visit the southern city of Al Wakra to discover another of Qatar's iconic venues. We continue to follow how the national teams are preparing for the big event. And we take a look inside one of the world's most sophisticated sports museums.